Okay, so we'll go ahead and do our panel discussion. And so kind of to start it off, I guess, I would like to ask the audience, is there uh, any outstanding questions that you guys have for our panel here? So I guess uh, start with Steven and then looking at some of those costs for the, those projects. You know, you talked about the cost per square foot, you know, some lower costs compared to the, some of those replacement costs. We've got about 250 bridges, a lot of small ones. We're looking at repair projects, 100 grand, 200 grand. The true bridge value cost is, say, 400 grand, right? Um, but when you factor in all the other things, well, now it's over a million dollars. So I guess that's why I was curious of, of those particular repair projects. You know, what was the replacement cost? You know, you said like $50, $60 a square foot for this rehab. You know, was, was the replacement cost a $10 million project so you weren't even thinking about that? Or, you know, how, how did that play into those decisions to do those repairs? And I guess with, you know, some of the other locals, you know, with the other panels, you know, were you guys looking at that at all with, with, with the other state agents or the uh, local agencies for some of those decisions? For every project, yeah, we, we do try to look at, at replacement costs and, and use a ballpark estimate for, for replacement of bridges. Um, here, for our initial project selections that were maybe done two years ago, we looked at, at trying to limit our bridge rehabilitation dollar of, of uh, structure costs to, to say, $30, $40. Um, recognizing that there's going to be a whole lot of traffic control. So it's a difficult answer, uh, and, and it's not, I, I don't know that I can answer um, for the overall project, but you can see from the replacement project examples that I provided, the bridge, for the bridges that you can close, the total project cost might be, um, and in Texas, it, it might be three times the cost for, um, for the bridge alone for the bridge component alone but if you're talking about an interstate type of project you're you're looking at at least 10 times potentially the um, the structure structure costs alone okay. just to add on to the answer Steve nailed it that the maintenance of traffic has it has the potential to really dominate a project and if he's got an interstate you know complete closure is probably not an option, but most localities aren't dealing with that on the whole. On the average, they have bridges that are closable. Uh, there is still, in my last 20 years, I've seen an increasing trend of a public sensitivity against having to do closures and the high weighting of the public perception value. But I think as the dollar costs have skyrocketed, you're probably going to see a the pendulum swing back the other way. And, and the necessity of telling your public uh, citizens there that we have to close this bridge in order to afford to do the work that needs to be done. You're going to see more closures driven by cost need and it's going to take a little willpower, you know, a little gut to, to step up and make that decision. But I think you'll find as those costs continue to dominate that it's going to be necessary to do that. And I would just add a quick piece from Oregon. So we don't have a lot of redundancy in our infrastructure. And so for us, closures are very rarely allowed. I think at the local level, maybe a little bit better. But a lot of times if you close a bridge, it's like a 60 mile detour. And so no one's willing to accept that. But I was recently doing a cost uh, uh, estimating worksheet. And I ran through the bridge pieces and came up with a deck preservation uh, project to do like an overlay and that kind of some minor joint repairs. And they came up with like $250,000. And I said, well, that's not how much they cost. And so I went and pulled some actual projects that had just let. And uh, what it was is for that project and for other similar ones, there was two plan sheets of bridge work for a bridge project and then 14 plan sheets uh, regarding erosion control, traffic control, and all the other pieces. And so the actual project cost was more like one and a half million. And so the actual value we're getting on our bridge, you know, bridge had to fund the whole project, but it can really be a challenge. Okay, I'm from Ohio. We have 88 counties, 15,000 bridges over 20 feet, and we have a law that goes down to 10 feet for bridge, so that adds another 10,000. We've got 25,000 bridges in 88 counties. How do I tell the county engineers who are struggling to keep their bridges open, let alone fix them, that they should divert money to preservation? That sort of touches on my topic today with the, the part of the purpose of that state of the structures report I referenced was as a communication tool. I suppose that county engineer answers to somebody, right? And probably a chain of command? No, they're elected officials, the answer to the public. So where do they get their funding to? Uh, gas tax. 
gas tax and motor vehicle registration is a dedicated source of funds. And it's a fairly predictable value. Right, then, right. And, and not a good way to increase it at all. Right. So it's a question of how he prioritizes where to spend what funds he has, and that's all he's going to get. Yep. And uh, if, if he's got condition problems that need to be addressed to, to just to keep bridges open, it's very hard sell on preventive maintenance then. That's tricky. The majority of our counties have uh, between five and 15 bridges are posted, several are closed, and their demand from the public is to get these bridges back open with no load limits. Mm -hmm. And they don't have enough funds to even send their crews out to wash the bridges and all that good preventative stuff, so it's a hard sell. When's the last time the gas tax was increased? The gas tax was increased in 2004. Maybe it's time to revisit that topic. Uh, we, are, we are talking, right? <laughs> if 88 counties got together and if, along with a few strategically arranged bridge closures, uh, maybe there could be some public well, support. When we have governor wants to run for president next time around, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> In Michigan, I would say we try to focus on the fair bridges just because we know we are never going to catch up with the structurally deficient if we don't slow the influx of structurally deficient bridges in the inventory. Um, so that's one way we try and sell it, is we've got our number, our influx number down from 140 down to like 25 a year. And without that, I don't think we ever would have made the progress that we've been able to make um, in hitting our goal of 90% uh, uh, in good, fair condition in the state for freeway bridges. So. Yeah, and uh, I can add just a little bit to that. The, basically, it is, is how do you get ahead when you start out so far behind, right? You already have a, a poor inventory. In Oregon, we have one of the largest percentage-wise population of fair bridges. So we're really good at avoiding poor because we, we focus on them. We don't have very many good ones because you have to build a new bridge to do that, and we haven't been doing a lot of replacements. And so we just have this huge influx of fair, and we get the same demands from our uh, on our state system, our district maintenance crews of, all bridges must stay open, and they don't. Anytime you put a load limit on a bridge, that's where they want you to divert funding. And so, right now, our maintenance program is kind of balanced, where about half of our funding is still going into preservation activities, and the other half is going to worse first, keep bridges open, avoid load postings. And we feel as that fair population continues to age, we're going to start having the, some of the same discussions at the state level. Uh, is there anyone here from Utah? Okay, Utah uh, has had great success on preservation front, and uh, they actually have had some really good presentations on it, but they have a very good inventory where focusing a lot of good funds on their good structures makes a lot of sense. And uh, it's, it's, I wish there was someone in here. I'm very jealous of Utah and their inventory. And then they actually passed something where they said, hey, if you want to keep it good, give us more funds, and they got a whole bunch more too. So it was a really good success story. But if you have very poor bridges, it's hard. To, you can't really preserve them. I mean, you can keep them open, but it takes a lot of effort. So just listen to the discussion. So I'm, I'm a county in Oregon, and our bridges are actually in pretty decent shape because the state has done investing in the last 15 years in local agency bridges. But, you know, it sounds to me a lot like pavement management where the difference is we can let a road go to complete crap and it's not going to, you know, you could still maneuver the potholes, whereas a bridge you have to close it. But... That's how we manage our pavements. If it's so bad we can't afford to fix it, we leave it alone and we pay our attention to the ones that we can still keep on that upper part of the curve. And you know, I, I would think that if we had a system where lots of things were pretty close to failing, the strategy might be take care of what you can to keep it good and then go to the public with the story about how much more expensive it is to replace a bridge than it is to just uh, do the preventative maintenance. We've been doing that with our roads, and it's been a pretty effective uh, message. The, the only problem with the pavement example is that as a pavement uh, uh, deteriorates, you'll have issues. You can still drive on it, though. Uh, with bridges, uh, once it gets bad enough, you have to actually start posting it and closing it, which takes away emergency services, uh, restricts the economy. I mean, all, bad roads will get you a, a poor economy also, right, eventually. But uh, that's kind of the real deal breaker that we've struggled with kind of hi highlight one of the things that we do in Texas. We, again, we've got a huge inventory. We get requests for funding for preservation of bridges that we eventually determine are too far gone. And we will say, you know what, this is not a good fit for our preservation program. Well, let's let it, let's let it 
go for a couple more years and, and let's start programming it for replacement in a couple of years. Um, because honestly, you can an ugly bridge is, is ugly for a long time before it's bad. You were talking about limiting your, your fare band or at least focusing on those bridges. Is that in your asset management plan that you're just, I mean, do you, do you have a, a target for your fare band? Is that in response to my comment? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, no, it's not that we're trying to limit it. It's that it's a massive, it's the biggest percentage of our population and by a long shot. So we have very small band of poor, a very small band of good, and mm -hmm. this massive inventory of fare. And so, right. uh, so we are doing preservation on the ones that are a higher fare and trying to keep those uh, good. But, I mean, in general, in Oregon, we need a more robust replacement plan to address some of those lower bound fair bridges and, and the poor ones so that we get, can get back into a uh, uh, preserving the good bridges as opposed to keeping the, the bad ones open. Right. And see, uh, I, was, uh, I was a very minor mouse level voice in developing our, our targets for the asset management. And really, I just want, what I wanted to do was limit the amount that we would have in fair and limit the amount that we would have in poor because those fair bridges are the ones that you want to focus on. You don't, you don't have to focus on the, on the good ones. They're eventually going to come down into the fair and need, and need boosted back up out of there. But I wanted to put you know, a 25% fair condition and 5% and poor condition. Yeah. You know that your pores are going to be replaced and you just want to focus on the pick which of those bridges in the fairs you are going to focus on and which ones are just going to be let go and replaced. Yeah, just... so, so I was not included in our asset management plan <laughs> discussion. So I wasn't even a small voice. I was in a different room. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I, I honestly can't answer, but I don't think that we set uh, goals regarding fair specifically. I think we kind of followed the, I guess you kind of get there, right? So the, the Fed said uh, set targets for poor and good, right? And so you can figure out what your target for fair was as part of that, right? Yeah, but it, in, in far too many cases, it, it seems to be we want to keep 85% in, in fair and good. But just like you're saying, if you got, if you got 70% in fair and you've only got 15% in good, then I guess it'd be higher than that, 75 and, and 15, and then you got your 10% limit on your those those fair bridges are the ones that give you the problem. I think your focus is great to to stay on that fair band and and get those one way or the other. But uh, I, I agree that the problem is is to get good bridges is you build them. You got right. You have to have a new one. It's really really hard to even with a very large rehab project to move from fair to good. And so George Hearn actually did a great report on this where he says that if you have a very robust preservation program, it'll be reflected by the fact that you have lots of fair bridges because you've kept them out of the low. It's really hard to keep a bridge good just by the way the coding guide's written, right? So fives and sixes is our bread and butter for stuff. It would be nice to have more sixes than fives, though. Mm -hmm. It's kind of where we're at. I used to work for Citibank, and the way we dealt with this for financial things like credit card losses and regions it's something called a rate volume chart, and you have to do it three different ways because one of them biases the rate, one of them biases the volume, so you take an average, and that's the third way. So, so that's one way to deal with that massive empire of fair. Yeah, I think financially it's an easy sell to say that it makes sense to have. Uh, like, so you can do a deck seal in Oregon for $1.50 a square foot, and that'll preserve that bridge deck, which is your highest value of the asset. You can do a rehab project for more on the lines of... Uh, you know, twenty five, thirty five dollars a square foot. I mean, it's an order of magnitude higher, uh, so it makes sense. And you can use the car analogy where it makes sense to change your oil instead of replace your engine. Uh, everyone gets it. The problem is, is you still only have a limited budget, and and then you have the criteria of keeping your system open. So, so until we start changing the criteria of closing bridges, then we just do preservation as much as we can, and then whack them all with the rest. Kind of a little different kind of a turn on this. So. The partnership has been very uh, interested for uh, the last couple of years, at least, putting more emphasis into increasing our outreach and inclusion of local agencies. And so part of that's a learning effort for a lot of us DOTs who have roles within the partnership. And so I've heard of different uh, conferences or different uh, 
Yeah, different conferences that are more geared towards local agencies. So there's LTAP and APWA. I just kind of want to throw it out to the panel members here and then to the audience also. What do you think are the conferences that would be worthwhile for us to spend time trying to reach out to and present at to reach bridge, uh, those that are making decisions on bridges in counties? Hi, everyone. I think that HPWA is an excellent organization. In Chicago, there are... Uh, is a metro chapter that oversees, I think, four or five branches. And I get so many newsletters of events coming up, things happening. They do uh, presentations on all types of topics, but I happen to know in downtown Chicago coming up, there's a presentation on Chicago bridges, which sounds really interesting. It talks about the history of our drawbridges, et cetera. So I think that if you are uh, involved on a state level, in a bridge agency or in a bridge format of some sort, I know that APWA would be very interested in having you as a speaker to listen to your advice or your input and your knowledge. Uh, I think they're always looking for new things to share with their members. Um, and then as I was sitting here reflecting a little, I think another way to reach the local agencies is just to offer training. And so I happened to see a flyer yesterday out on the uh, on the desk, at the registration desk. and. In Michigan, um, two gentlemen are offering training for local agencies, and I understand they're going to be doing this training in Indiana. So I'm very excited to bring this back, uh, talk to some of my former colleagues at Lake County DOT, where I used to work in design, and I know the construction people. I, I don't really know who they would want to have that training, but I'm going to send it to the maintenance engineer, the construction engineer, the design engineer, and the guy that I know does some of the bridge inspections and figure if I put this together and we find a place to host it, would you be interested in coming? So I don't mind being a little bit of a catalyst because I think sometimes the local agency themselves has to be the one to kind of share with their other local agencies. I guess the it seems in my experience that a lot of the states have some sort of LTAP type organization that's outreaching to locals for a various technical areas, but Bridge would be one of them. And I suppose uh, is it probably true in most states the counties report up through the states to the federal so that the states are in touch with who owns bridges mm -hmm. in the local agencies? And so you may suffer somewhat from the fact that a lot of those folks who are in the local agencies, it's it's not all they're doing, that Like kind of like I mentioned in my presentation, and maybe they don't really get to go to a bridge conference ever because they do so much more than bridges. And so it's harder to find them at those conferences, but working through the state level connections, the DOT type connections who know where the bridge owners are, maybe you could get an email list, a newsletter connection type list and, and send out outreach type stuff, find them that way. As a county, the cities probably have the equivalent, I don't know. The National Association of County Engineers is a very large, very active organization that has NACE. an annual conference, NACE, every year. It's in the Midwest, uh, this year, I think it's in Wisconsin. Um, they've come out west before, but it's very well attended. And bridges are already a topic of conversation there. So that, I think, would be a great place. And I know a lot of states in Oregon, we happen to be one of them where we have a pretty strong county engineer organization within the state. And I know there's a lot of other states that are the same. And we have our own annual conferences as well. So at least for counties, it's an excellent way to get a hold of people and discuss and talk. I worked in Bureau of Local Projects for KDOT for four and a half years or so. NACE is great if there is a county engineer. I think of 105 counties, I think 25 or so in Kansas actually have a county engineer. The rest of them just have a consultant as an act, acting county engineer. Two of the best organization or meetings that I would go to were the Kansas County Highway Association and then the Kansas Association of Counties. There would be both city and counties yeah. there. I saw more county bridge and supervisors, uh, county road and bridge supervisors at those two meetings than I did at the APWA <laughs> meetings. Because okay. that's just city folk meeting, talk about public works where they're, they're talking about county roads. So yeah. in their minds, it's not quite the same thing. APWA is not quite the same thing as, as uh, throwing gravel down on, on county roads. One thing about the Kansas Association of Counties is an ex-county engineer is president of that organization and is constantly needling KDOT for 
how to do more training, how to, I, I would say one of his biggest projects is how to train sheriff's de deputies. They pull a semi over that's overloaded. Truck driver says, no, that icon only has three axles on it. I've got six. And they say, oh, okay. I've, we've, we, we've, we've experienced issues with that as well. <laughs> we've had one issue where there was a, the, it was restricted for the dump truck, so they pulled an empty pup behind them because now they had more axles and it did not look like the sign. Right. Thought that was actually pretty clever. I would have let him go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but well, you can also have have farmers carrying a loaded grain cart that is yeah. by far uh, overloading that bridge, but it's not on the sign. So yeah, I, I presented so many things to to that ex county engineer, and he's a great asset to be a go between on on the state agency and the county counties but that would certainly be an outreach yeah. effort to go to to meetings well, like that too that's great feedback so uh several of the partnerships that have local agency outreach working groups and the intent is is we're going to start developing some small presentations that kind of can be formed to whatever the county or city or tribe is interested in listening to and it'll be an effort where someone will try and get industry to support and then someone local to also uh, that's a, an owner to go and give those presentations to them and lunchtime or if they have a half day those kind of a things uh, and so that's that's great feedback we'll definitely look into those if anyone here is interested in participating in the working groups there is a sign up sheet at the registration desk don't feel like if you sign up then you're going to be saddled with hours and hours of work it's a collaboration and it's all volunteer based so uh, uh, if you're interested in, in being engaged with that. And some of it can just be, we just need contact information. So even if you can't help with the giving the presentation or developing it, the third step is finding people to present it to. So I would encourage you to consider that. Um, can we give our panel one more round of applause, please? They did a fantastic job. And that'll, and that'll conclude our session. Thank you. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.